Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you here. I'm Jan Barris, the Vice President of the National Committee. We're delighted to see a lot of old friends here, um, some new faces, and we are very pleased you could be with us this morning. Our President, Steve Orland, sends his regards. He's off on a, I think, a beach somewhere in Southeast Asia. Um, working hard. Working hard. <laughs> Uh, but he is very sorry that he cannot be here. He's uh, an old Hong Kong hand, as are many people in this room. And we're just so pleased, though, that Jerry Cohn, our beloved Jerry Cohn, can be here with us and serve as the moderator. Uh, because while um, I know and love Hong Kong, having lived there, uh, we just ascertained slightly after <laughs> uh, the, our our primary guest was born. Um, I don't know much, as much as Jerry does about the legal aspects of Hong Kong. So um, I am very, very pleased. And if we can get Jerry a pen that writes better, we'll... Uh, I'll find something. Are you sure? Okay, because okay. We'll no, I have to learn where I find. Okay. I got a million. Um, <laughs> so Jerry is going to be the host. Okay, okay. And we want to, this to be... Um, uh, a very informal um, opportunity for you to both listen I, I, from our guest whose name I wanted to ask him about, but I haven't <laughs> yet. I assume his parents were great, at, were great listeners of classical music, but if there's another reason for your name, you should let us know that. Uh, but let me turn it over to Jerry, and again, welcome everyone, and look forward to a very interesting and stimulating conversation. I said earlier <clears throat> to the Secretary for Justice that uh, there is so much news about China every day uh, in our press, including today, but there isn't much about Hong Kong. And whatever else one thinks of Benny Tai and Occupy Central, at least he got Hong Kong noticed in our media. And it's very similar to the situation with Taiwan. Uh, unless 100,000 people parade in front of President Ma's office, people don't pay any attention. And yet Taiwan and Hong Kong are going to be increasingly important. And while today perhaps the Times editorial is preoccupied understandably with yesterday's arbitration decision uh, by uh, the tribunal handling the Philippines suit against China on the law of the sea. Uh, Hong Kong, day in, day out, has an importance that makes it urgent for us to understand more about it. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, the Secretary for Justice. I've known many of his predecessors. They're usually all articulate, dynamic, often humorous observers and participants in the scene. And having had a brief conversation now with uh, uh, Mr. Yuan, I'm confident he's succeeding in that tradition. So what we'd like you to do, if you don't mind, is start out with 10 or 15 minutes of how you see the situation. Uh, and then we'll have a chance to uh, ask lots of questions. We welcome you warmly. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, and thank you, uh very much for giving me this uh, opportunity to come here and uh, meet all of you. Uh, it's indeed my uh, great honor to have this uh, opportunity. Professor just now uh, mentioned Mr. Benny Tai, who happens to be my uh, classmate. <laughs> <laughs> who else was in that class? <laughs> Well, in fact, uh, another name which you uh, often come across in the uh, Hong Kong newspapers, uh, Mr. Eric Zheng, John Tat Ming, oh, yeah. uh, who is also a, an associate professor in the Hong Kong University Law School, is also my classmate. Good. <laughs> we, are, we are in the same class. But of course, um, speaking for myself, I would love uh, Hong Kong to be in the news, positive news, not because of uh, something which uh, happened uh, end of last year, but because of something better. Uh, I have this opportunity to come here to talk to you. I uh, guess um, possibly uh, one uh, aspect which many people uh, would be interested to know is how Hong Kong is doing. 
after the so-called Occupy movement or the Occupy Central uh, movement. As the uh, Secretary for Justice, perhaps if I may uh, look at it uh, from the uh, legal perspective, I would say, hands on heart, that uh, despite the Occupy movement, the rule of law in Hong Kong remains well and alive. In particular, in particular, uh, the independent judiciary has been doing very well in handling all matters, whether relating to the Occupy movement or in other aspects. The whole movement, as you would recall, uh, came to an end in a relatively uh, peaceful manner. Both in the course of the movement and subsequently our court has uh, demonstrated uh, independence and professionalism in handling all the cases. In fact, uh, one of the uh, factors which contribute to the peaceful uh, determination of the movement is the granting of injunction by the court in uh, Hong Kong. It was on the application of various parties who were affected by the Occupy movement and the court of first instance of the High Court, having heard arguments from both sides, granted the uh, injunction. In fact, uh, it was observed by our Chief Justice, <coughs> Mr. Justice Jeffrey Ma, earlier this year in our uh, traditional opening of legal year, that the way in which the injunction applications were dealt with, in fact, illustrate that, first of all, people in Hong Kong, irrespective of which stance they take in relation to the movement, respect the rule of law, and it also demonstrates the independence of the judiciary. Because when uh, considering the application, first of all, both sides have counsel, and in fact some have uh, what we call leading counsel or senior counsel addressing the court. The court heard detailed argument on both sides and then came to a decision. And it is very, very clear, both in the course of the argument, in the course of the hearing, as well as in the eventual decisions that the judge made, the court looked at the matter purely from the legal perspective. The court did not in any way take into account the political stance, still let, uh, let alone make any judgment on who is right or who is wrong from the political perspective. Indeed, indeed, uh, in one of the uh, judgments concerning the injunction, uh, the court of first instance make it very, very clear in the judgment that the court only concerns with the law. The court will not take into account the political stance of either side. <coughs> the court also stress that irrespective of one's political stance and irrespective of how noble one's political aspiration may be, it is important for a society like Hong Kong, which cherish the notion of the rule of law, to respect the law and to do what is within the limit allowed by the law. And after the injunction uh, were granted, uh, the court, together with the parties, with the assistance of the bailiff and other uh, relevant personnel, uh, enforced the injunction. It was done with the assistance of the police, 
and on the whole, it was a peaceful uh, termination of the movement pursuant to the uh, injunction. I should perhaps add a little bit that uh, in the course of the uh, legal proceedings, uh, some of them also have the chance to take the matter to the higher court, and in fact the uh, higher court, which is the Court of Appeal, also dealt with the matter very expeditiously and endorsed the various points that I made earlier uh, in relation to the judgment of the Court of First Instance. And the Court of Appeal again reiterate the stance that the court is only concerned with the legal argument and not the political stance of either side. And once the uh, uh, injunctions were granted, as I was saying earlier, people expect that to be uh, respected. And although there is some uh, minor hoo-ha, if I may put it that way, that everything came uh, to an end in the way that uh, respect uh, that we expected, and uh, after the uh, cessations of the uh, movement, another question which has often come up, and which I think I feel obliged to perhaps say a few words on this occasion, and that is uh, how are those people involved in the movement being handled in the context of criminal uh, justice. This is something which uh, my department is responsible. Uh, perhaps just to give you a little bit of background, um, the, the situation in Hong Kong uh, now, in that particular aspect, is very much similar to the situation in the United Kingdom prior to their reform in about 2005 and 2006. Uh, my role as the Secretary for Justice is essentially the same as the role taken on by uh, what they call the Attorney General in the United Kingdom. So although I am a politically appointed official, I'm also at the same time uh, responsible to, uh, to be in charge of the Department of Justice. And under our mm -hmm. basic law, which is the constitutional document of Hong Kong, there is an express provision in the Basic Law, which is Article uh, 63, that the Department of Justice is responsible for handling all criminal prosecution free from any interference. And by that expression, of course, it would include uh, free from political or any other undue inference. We have all <coughs> along taken this constitutional duty very, very seriously, and we are acutely aware that in handling suspected criminal case arising from the Occupy movement is a very sensitive matter, and therefore uh, what we have done are to uh, ensure independence is that from time to time, apart from uh, scrutinizing the case by our internal team, who are civil servants employed by the uh, department, specializing in criminal prosecutions, they are not politically appointed, they are politically neutral. So first of <coughs> all, there is this team headed by the director <coughs> of public prosecutions who is also not a political appointee to take charge of the matter. We also, from time to time, employed a mechanism whereby we would uh, engage outside barristers, outside legal experts, to advise on criminal prosecutions. That would include expertise or experts uh, from Hong Kong, and at times we also engage experts from London who are more often than not very top criminal silks, uh, criminal Queen's Council in uh, London. The point is to ensure that uh, we would have independent advice from these experts. 
perhaps uh, one example that uh, I can give is I guess many of you here uh, would have come across a case where one of the person participated in the movement was said to have been assaulted by seven police officers in the course of the uh, Occupy movement. That case is one of the cases in which we have uh, used the mechanism that I just described. First of all, it was studied by our internal team. Secondly, uh, we engaged both Hong Kong and also London uh, experts on criminal law to uh, advise on, first of all, whether there is sufficient evidence to warrant criminal prosecution. Secondly, whether or not it is in the public interest uh, to commence prosecution. And thirdly, because there are different scenarios happened in, uh, in a series of quite a short span of time involving both suspected criminal activities by the person who complained against the police and also the activities concerning the police. So how the two cases should be dealt with is uh, also a question which calls for uh, detailed uh, legal consideration. And that is the reason why we also engaged the two uh, experts, both from Hong Kong and from UK. And after we obtained the uh, advice, we uh, followed the advice given by the experts, and eventually uh, charges were being pressed uh, in that case. That goes to uh, demonstrate that we are very conscious of the role to be independent. And also I can uh, add that in relation to all the cases arising from the Occupy movement, as in all the other cases that we have handled, whether <coughs> concerning public order, whether arising from the Occupy movement or otherwise, the considerations are done by the, <coughs> by the Department of Justice and by the Department of Justice alone. Our file never leave our office. We never consult other government departments as to whether prosecution should or should not be made because that is our responsibility and our responsibility alone. And all our teams have been extremely uh, cautious about ensuring this is the way uh, to be done. Uh, <coughs> there are from time to time in the uh, media uh, suggestions that uh, prosecutions are being politically motivated. I can say hands on heart that is not true. And I regret to say that perhaps that is an allegation which has been too lightly made from time to time without any solid foundation. In sort, uh, people will suggest, because I came out to demonstrate for a political cause, and therefore, uh, even if I break the law, and if you prosecute me, then that amounts to political prosecutions. I would beg to differ, that would be the proper approach. As I was saying, we do not look at the political stance, we look at whether the conduct has gone beyond the limit allowed by the law. And in fact, if you uh, look at the cases which we have prosecuted in the past year or so, uh, the defendants involved in those prosecutions, they have very different political opinions. Some of them are against the government, some of them are in support of the government. But that is, to, our, to us, when making the decision, is utterly and completely irrelevant. I hope that uh, <coughs> gives you a, a, a first eye view on the Occupy movement. Yes? Yeah. Um, could you refresh my memory on how many prosecutions there Excuse were? Can I ask you just to say who you are? Oh, oh sure. I'm Bill Armbruster. I'm a retired journalist. Uh, how many pro cases did you prosecute uh, as a result of the Occupy movement, and what was the outcome of those? trials, or, or if, in fact, they have all been concluded, 
and in particular with the one case of this one person you said was said to have been assaulted by seven police officers and, and you decided to go ahead with the prosecution, whom did you prosecute, the police or, or that individual? But so, maybe if you would like, uh, sorry, if you would like to continue uh, with your presentation, we can hold that until yeah, we take I'm, all, I'm of the, all of the questions at the same time. Yeah, I, I, I'm fine either way. Perhaps, uh, in fact, I'm coming to an end, and I just okay. want to uh, <coughs> add, <coughs> excuse me, just want to add um, one other aspect, um, which is different from the Occupy movement. Um, and, and that is, uh, and that concerns with another aspect, which uh, we, uh, the Hong Kong community, uh, uh, is also extremely, extremely uh, careful in uh, maintaining, and that is that we uh, want to have a clean Hong Kong, uh, a corruption-free Hong Kong. I think in that aspect, um, we are, or we have been very proud <coughs> with the work done by the Independent Commission Against uh, Corruption, the ICAC. The reason why I raise this topic is when I uh, go around uh, other uh, countries after I have taken up this post, there have been uh, discussions and also questions ever since uh, the uh, case concerning a very senior government official which we prosecuted sometime last year. You might have read about that uh, in the media. Uh, one of the former chief secretary of Hong Kong, uh, Mr. Rafael Hoi, who were prosecuted together with uh, certain uh, property developers. Uh, he was convicted uh, together with uh, two other persons. And in fact, the uh, appeal will be coming up uh, next week. That case has uh, understandably caught uh, uh, attention uh, both in Hong Kong and indeed beyond. And uh, similarly, I understand and I, and I would say it's also understandable that uh, our recent decisions to uh, commence criminal prosecutions against our former chief executive, Mr. Donald Dunn, has also caused uh, certain attention both uh, Hong Kong and also uh, <coughs> internationally. Uh, the point that I want to make is, despite this prosecution, Hong Kong remain a clean society. And in fact, uh, I would not agree that the mere fact that there are these prosecution uh, would goes to show that uh, corruption is getting serious in Hong Kong. Rather, uh, on the, uh, <coughs> on the uh, positive side, it goes to show that Hong Kong remains very, very uh, vigilant in guarding against any untoward conduct, any conduct which works on corruption. And it goes to show, first of all, that the Independent Commission Against Corruption is working effectively in investigating uh, those allegations. It also goes to show that our court system is working robustly and independently in coming into a decision in those cases. So I, I would say, uh, rather than looking at those individual cases in the negative light, they are, in fact, positive signs that we still maintain zero tolerance policy <coughs> towards uh, corruption. I guess that's all I want to say. Perhaps before I forget, if I may yeah. answer your your, sure. your question, just in case. I'm, 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 I'm sorry for interjecting. Before. No, no worry. Uh, I, I don't have all the uh, figures with me uh, concerning the, the but. prosecutions. But what I can say is, in a way, the uh, prosecutions has not all been uh, completed. So uh, at as of now, we don't have a complete answer as to how many people uh, uh, have been prosecuted. And uh, in fact, you're also right in pointing out that some of those cases, the prosecution has commenced, but they are still going on. Uh, because the, uh, very often in Hong Kong, what we have is 
the defendant was brought before the court, then we would have uh, what we call a pretrial review, and then the court will fix another date, which is the formal trial date, and quite often uh, there will be uh, a few months time gap in between those two. So not all the uh, cases have been uh, completed. And the last question you ask is the uh, person who is said to have uh, been uh, as assaulted by the seven, seven police officers, uh, <coughs> both group, i.e. the person who complained, and also the seven police officers have been prosecuted. Perhaps if I may explain why the person who complained uh, has also been uh, prosecuted, is <laughs> because the, uh, the whole incident happened this way. The person who complained, uh, known as a Mr. Zhan, he was found to be somewhere in the, in the scene of uh, the Occupy movement. Uh, he was seen to have been floating certain unknown or unidentified liquid with weird smell yeah. <laughs> from a bottle or bottles onto uh, several police officers. And when he was uh, asked to stop, he uh, declined as a result of which he was arrested. And then uh, after the arrest, he then launched a complaint that he was assaulted by another group of police officers. So in a way, it's, uh, put it very, very briefly, it's two cases. One case is the uh, uh, alleged wrongful conduct on the part of Mr. Zhang. The second case is the alleged wrongful conduct on the part of the seven police officer. We take the will that we should look at them individually, and because both cases on the advice of both Hong Kong and London uh, barristers, that there were sufficient evidence in both cases, and that's why we prosecuted both group of defendants. In fact, uh, for the purpose of ensuring fairness uh, in both cases, we prosecute them, or we commence the prosecution on the same day, so that each of them know that the other had also been prosecuted. And the reason being that they could then confer <coughs> with their lawyers so that they can make whatever submissions they want to make to the court to ensure that their trial would be fair. Because say, if, if I am Mr. Dunn, uh, I might think that if my case go first, it might affect my complaint against the police officers and vice versa. And that's the reason why we haven't consulted experts on uh, criminal procedure, took the deliberate steps to ensure that they are being synchronized so that they can have a fair trial. Yeah. You have given us a very impressive and effective presentation that not only informs us, but also demonstrates your skills as an advocate. Uh, and it's, a, it's a really good opening. Uh, I don't want us to dwell unduly on the details of individual cases, although I think uh, they're very important. But before going to more general rule of law questions that concern Hong Kong and all of us, there is that one case that South China Morning Post reported of a woman purportedly being prosecuted for assaulting a police officer with her breast. Can <laughs> 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 you tell us, is that, is that a real case or is that a joke? <laughs> that is a real case. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, and uh, without the uh, slightest disrespect to uh, the media who <laughs> reported the uh, matter, uh, the proper description of the case is not exactly in the way it has been uh, reported. So now you're really intriguing. There must be more to this. What else did she use? <laughs> in, what, happened, what happened in that case was there was um, a certain event in the course of the uh, Occupy movement, uh, sorry, in the, in the course of a certain protest, and then there was a certain exchange between the civilians and also the police officers. 
and that uh, it happens uh, that the conduct constitute uh, assaulting police officer as well as obstructing police officers in the course of uh, the executions of the duty. The magistrate who uh, decided the case, in fact, when he described the relevant part, what the magistrate found as a fact after hearing the evidence is that the uh, woman in, in question deliberately uh, intervened in the conduct of the police officer's discharge of duty. She was trying to use her body to prevent the police officers from moving forward. And, he, and uh, the police officer also found as a fact upon hearing the evidence that the woman, the, the, uh, woman in, person, uh, in, in question threatened to the police officer to say, if you do not stop, I would shout out for help on the ground of indecent assault. So the, uh, in, in put it very, very briefly, the magistrate having heard the evidence found that the female defendant was trying to block the police officer and trying to fabricate a case of indecent assault against the police officer, when in fact no indecent assault ever uh, took place. Good. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, the media were trying to describe it in a very vivid manner. <laughs> Some uh, even went so far as to say, since when uh, a female's uh, breast has become a weapon. <laughs> well, that has a long history. <laughs> uh, then I have to say, I have no personal experience. <laughs> I would like to move on to a more general but very serious question also. Uh, you mentioned the great continuing progress Hong Kong has made with judicial independence and the rule of law. Uh, wherever we look, whether in America or Taiwan or Hong Kong, uh, mainland China, Authorities and people are struggling with the relationship of politics to government, law, authority. And we're getting a variety of solutions. Uh, in, as you know, in Taiwan since 1987, we've seen enormous progress because they have a constitutional court that has contributed greatly to the growth of judicial independence, democracy, etc. Uh, Taiwan uh, and the mainland have great differences here. The mainland is struggling uh, with these questions. Uh, on the one hand, the fourth party plenum last year was consumed with the rule of law and party control. They're schizophrenic, it seems to me. Question, of course, in Hong Kong, we have always assumed the traditional system would persist. There have recently been some remarks and speeches made by the chief executive, by the chief Chinese representative uh, in Hong Kong that raise questions about what is the understood constitutional arrangement? What is the political theory that underlies the basic law mm -hmm. and Hong Kong's future government? Uh, is there judicial independence in the sense that the chief executive himself is subject to the basic law and other principles that govern uh, his behavior? Or is the chief executive above the other departments? And is the separation of powers, British style as inherited, part of the continuing understanding of the basic law, or is it basic law informed by the mainland constitutional system where the chief of the government, National People's Congress and its designees control the courts and the prosecution uh, and other agencies. So where does this constitutional debate stand? I see that uh, uh, Mr. Zhang, I think his name is the head of the liaison office, 
uh, in uh, Hong Kong made a statement that the separation of powers doesn't apply anywhere below the central government of a country which every American state would repudiate. So it's not an accurate statement. On the other hand, the dean of the Tsinghua University Law School, Wang Junmin, a very able constitutional scholar who was on the Basic Law Advisory Committee, etc., I understand is being posted to Hong Kong, and that may raise the level of uh, central government representatives' understanding. But could you tell us where this stands? Does the chief executive stand above the courts, or is he really subject uh, to judicial review and the usual <coughs> constraints that a legal system's courts would put on the executive? Yes. Um, thank you for that question. I think to me, the answer is uh, very clear. No one, and I emphasize no one, in Hong Kong is above the law. And I think that is the fundamentals of the concept of the rule of law. Of course, I appreciate many uh, people have uh, uh, different uh, formulation or definitions of the rule of law, <coughs> but I think the most basic and most fundamental concept is no one, irrespective of your position, social status, or belief, is above the law. First of all, in the, uh, in the basic law of Hong Kong, we have expressed provisions that everyone is subject to and shall be obliged to uh, comply with the uh, law in Hong Kong. Uh, as far as I am concerned, particularly wearing my hat as the Secretary for Justice, no one, including the Chief Executive, is above the law. In fact, uh, uh, I think one or two weeks ago, I was asked a uh, similar uh, questions in Hong Kong by a, uh, a reporter. Uh, the question posed to me is, does the chief executive enjoy immunity from criminal prosecution? And we answer that question in no uncertain terms that the chief executive in Hong Kong, like anyone else in Hong Kong, does not enjoy immunity from criminal prosecutions. Even during his term in Taiwan, remember, they couldn't prosecute Chen Shui-bian until he stepped down from the presidency, but they got him the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, of course, uh, appreciate that different uh, jurisdictions have different regime regulating immunity, if any. But uh, in Hong Kong, uh, we stress that both uh, former <coughs> incumbent and future chief executive <laughs> does not enjoy criminal prosecution's immunity. There have been calls for investigation of the business arrangements of the current chief executive, and some people think uh, the investigation should go further than they apparently have. Uh, could you give us any light on that? Um, well, uh, yes and no, in a sense that uh, because of the law in Hong Kong, uh, it uh, do not allow me to disclose uh, details of investigations by ICAC, and therefore, uh, for that legal reasons, I am duty bound to maintain uh, the confidentiality uh, covering the investigation. But, but. <coughs> Perhaps, uh, if I may try to write on that question, the mere fact that someone feels comfortable to lodge a complaint against an incumbent chief executive, and the mere fact that investigation actually entails after the complaint goes to show, first of all, the point that I made earlier, <coughs> no one is above the law, and secondly, that people in Hong Kong actually respect the rule of law, and that we have institutions to ensure that cherished notion is being carried into 
the effect. So should one infer from your answer that there is an ongoing investigation of the chief executive? I do not think I can say yes, but I cannot say no. <laughs> <laughs> You're really great. <laughs> I, I take that as a compliment. <laughs> Chris Merck. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm uh, Christian Merck with the uh, Yale China Association, and I, I'd like to change the subject, if you would, yeah. and ask you to talk a little bit about the development of privacy law in Hong Kong. And the reason I ask this is I think yesterday uh, David Webb lost an appeal to the Administrative Appeals Board, which requires him to uh, redact from previously published judicial decisions the names of the individuals who were involved in those cases, even though he obtained that information from the website of the courts. The decisions were published, I think, in 2001 and 2002, and uh, an individual who was involved in that, uh, because it didn't appear in a very favorable light, no longer wants her name associated with that decision, and, and the Administrative Appeals Board agreed yesterday with a prior ruling. So this establishes in Hong Kong uh, a European-style right to be forgotten. Uh, <laughs> one could say that it's a rather quixotic ruling because Hong Kong judicial decisions are also available on offshore websites. So it's a decision which, in, in effect, uh, closes down Mr. Webb's ability to report it. It doesn't necessarily close down the ability of Hong Kong people to find it out. So one could query the, uh, the, the, the course of this development on several grounds, but I, I wonder if you would talk more broadly about the administration and the development of privacy law in Hong Kong. And I have a technical question also. Well, let's you... just deal, for Chris, with the first one, which is okay. already very complicated and important. But it demonstrates that at least there are a few people in New York who are following Hong Kong legal questions with a <laughs> high degree of specificity. I don't, want you, I don't want you to infer that any of us know what in the world he's talking about. <laughs> And I hope you will also not presume that I understand the question. <laughs> well, uh, it's, a very, it's a very good question, but uh, as Professor was saying just now, uh, it's also a very complicated uh, question. The uh, uh, reason why the tribunal came to the decisions that you uh, mentioned just now is because the tribunal uh, was acting on the basis of the current legal regime in Hong Kong uh, governing uh, the law of uh, personal data uh, privacy. Uh, admittedly, admittedly, there are uh, quite uh, different uh, opinions on the uh, current status of the uh, data privacy law in Hong Kong. Although uh, the current legal regime was based primarily primarily uh, under uh, the, uh, after the uh, UK model, although it has also taken into account uh, the situation in some other common law jurisdictions. Uh, but there are, on the one hand, as you uh, rightly point out, uh, opinions that perhaps in some areas is uh, too restrictive. And there are also opinions that perhaps uh, the law in this area, uh, which is not the only area of the law which have this problem, but uh, there is opinion to suggest that the law in this area perhaps is not really on par with the uh, technological advances that we have been either facing or enjoying. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, there are also people who takes uh, the who takes the view that uh, perhaps uh, one should be very, very cautious before uh, changing the current uh, regime. So uh, because of all this opinion, uh, what we have been, what we have been uh, trying to do is to see how things develop. And I, I think I can also uh, tell you that uh, one of my role as the uh, secretary for Justice is that I'm also the ex officio uh, chairman of the Law Reform Commission 
of Hong Kong. Uh, I, as the chairman, uh, together with the Chief uh, Justice of the Court of Final Appeal, we are at liberty to bring up topics that we believe merit consideration for the purpose of seeing whether the law in that area should be reformed. We have regular meetings from time to time, and we uh, keep uh, on to watch out to see whether uh, the law in any particular area should be uh, reformed. And data privacy is constantly on our radar screen. I would just point out that um, a week or so ago, it was legal in Hong Kong to take a judgment previously published by the courts and repeat it. It is now not legal to do so in all cases. No, no, that's not the case. That's, that's not the case. It's not legal for Mr. Webb to do so in this particular case. And that is a fairly major change in Hong Kong's use of privacy laws. I, if I may explain that, uh, I think judgments of the courts in Hong Kong, they are publicly available. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, you can check the website of the Hong Kong judiciary. They have a particular sections uh, where they would give you all the uh, decided cases uh, of uh, Hong Kong. The point that uh, you are referring is, in the data privacy law of Hong Kong, there is one particular aspect which says that even though some of the data of a person has been made public by certain means, the fact that you were collecting those public data and then use it for some other purposes, that would, in some circumstances, be contrary to the data privacy restrictions in Hong Kong. So it's two different concepts. And in other words, uh, one is still at full liberty to check the websites of the uh, judiciary. It is now been redacted, however. Well, it depends on which source you are trying to, to, to do so. So it's the purposes for which the data is being used is the, cru is the crucial determination or the line is being drawn. Uh, Chris, you want to say anything yeah. further? Well, my understanding is that the court has now gone back and changed the document that they originally published by removing the names of the individual in question. So that uh, previously, when it was originally published 10 years ago, whatever it was, the, it was there. It is no longer there today. And it is illegal for anyone in the media to publish that information for the for, uh, So I, I find this actually um, somewhat uh, new in Hong Kong and somewhat potentially chilling with respect to the media. Yes, please. Uh, sorry, following up on Chris's remark. Can't um, hear you, please. And introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Nick Frisch. I'm a, a PhD student at Yale studying in the Chinese Studies Department. I'm also a resident fellow at uh, Yale Law School in the Information Society Project. Uh, but in a previous life, I worked in uh, Hong Kong, and I should disclose, in the media. Uh, uh, and in fact, on this subject, uh, which I wrote about. Um, David Webb, for those who have been following his career, has uh, tangled with this situation previously with uh, company registry databases, where he's been taking information that was publicly available and reformatting it and making it available on his own website, and then was faced uh, with complaints that ended up with his taking that information down. Uh, and in the eyes of many, it contributes to a pattern where there are perfectly uh, legal, rational moves uh, that are consistent with the rule of law and consistent with the application of the privacy law, uh, but have the sum effect of uh, chilling discourse and discouraging uh, citizen or journalistic participation. And in the case of um, not the uh, redacted names in the legal statements, but the company's bureau, as the uh, company's registration database, uh, this information was used in a lot of journalism that. Um, traced the holdings of uh, the relatives of Politburo members in Hong Kong. And it was instrumental for a lot of the journalism that came out uh, three years ago. And so when LegCo passed the law to redact it, many people were uh, concerned. Uh, and David Webb ended up taking it down from his site. So uh, 
a lot of the function of the judiciary is not just to apply the law, but to be seen to be applying the law at all times. Is this something that, uh, you know, justice is blind, but you do keep an eye on PR. Uh, <laughs> and really, when it comes down to it, Hong Kong's most important role is to maintain investor confidence in its institutions. So that can't come into a consideration for individual cases that you could comment on, but as a general matter, what do you see in this pattern that uh, Chris identified of um, uh, actions that have a, a good legal explanation but end up damaging investor confidence or confidence in Hong Kong's judiciary? Yeah. I, I uh, perfectly understand your, your observations. Well, you're if ahead it of is, me. Uh, if it is, sorry. <laughs> I say you're ahead of me. <laughs> I'm uh, just pretending to be. <laughs> uh, if it is of any uh, comfort, uh, can I uh, say this? I First of all, I repeat the point that I made earlier. I fully appreciate there are different views to this matter. But uh, the situation is uh, such that uh, not only private individuals are being subject to this law, irrespective of whether you think this law makes sense or it, that this law should be reformed. Uh, I can tell you that the government uh, is also subject to this law, and in a way, at times we also have to uh, uh, we also have problems arising from this problems in quotation mark perhaps and in the neutral sense of the uh, of the word. Uh, I gave you one example. Um, a few years ago, uh, 2012, uh, you might have read from the newspapers that there is a very unfortunate uh, collision of two vessels outside Lemma Island in Hong Kong, which caused a lot of uh, casualties. Uh, after that, uh, we uh, launched an inquiry. We formed a commission of inquiry, uh, chaired by a judge, looked into the uh, cause of the collision, and uh, a report was published by that uh, commission of inquiry, and then, uh, very understandably, the victims and also the families of those who unfortunately died in the collision uh, would like to find out what happened and what caused the uh, tragedy. Um, well. The long and short of the story is, although the report somehow became public uh, information because it was in the public domain, but when we deal with the families in the further course of that matter, when there were subsequent uh, in, in, uh, internal investigations <coughs> and the questions arises as to whether there should be uh, publications of the unredacted version of both the uh, original commission of inquiry report and the subsequent uh, government internal inquiry into uh, the matter, we face the same legal issue, namely that despite in some instances the information became available in the public, we are not, we meaning the government, we are not at liberty to somehow make use of that and provide the uh, information requested by the uh, families. So the point that I'm trying to make is I'm not trying to find an excuse to say that uh, this is a very satisfactory state of the law. I still reckon that there are arguments in favor of changing the law. But what the point that I'm trying to make is, is definitely not a case if it be the perception that the administration is trying somehow to have this law which people think is unreasonable to suppress information. That's not the case. The case is, I think, uh, the law has been made some time ago and we are facing a situation whether from the point of view of advance of technology or uh, the angle that you very rightly point out, uh, perception uh, PR, uh, whether uh, the law should somehow be changed to facilitate the uh, greater use of information which otherwise would be available in the public domain. That is something which uh, definitely we will be looking into. One question I'd like to pursue that raises issues of both extradition 
which has become controversial in U.S.-China relations, although it hasn't been highly publicized, and also is another version of this problem between law and morality, or your title is Secretary for Justice, not Secretary for Law. In Singapore, they separate the Attorney General from the Secretary for Law. But justice implies a recognition not only of the technical legal situation of enforcing whatever law there is in, uh, that's prevailing, uh, but also what is the right thing if one can figure out what the right thing is. Now, this raises the question of Snowden. Uh, could you clarify what is the situation? Uh, we get the impression from the press that the U.S. asked Hong Kong to uh, surrender Snowden to us via extradition because we have a treaty uh, with Hong Kong, unlike uh, we don't have a treaty with the mainland for mm. some good reasons. Uh, could you tell us about that? Uh, I personally think some of the things that happened as a result of Snowden were good for our democracy, but I understand also that they did some real harm, and it was a violation uh, of our law. And this gets back to the Occupy Central question. But could you just clarify, as you admirably do on other respects, what happened in Snowden case? I think in the uh, uh, case of Snowden, uh, again, uh, we did not take any stance as to whether the conduct of Mr. Snowden was right or wrong, whether from the political perspective or from the legal perspective. The reason being that it's not for us in Hong Kong to decide whether Mr. Snowden is a hero or something other than a hero. It's also not for us in Hong Kong to decide whether Mr. Snowden has acted in breach of U.S. law because that is a matter for the court of the U.S.A. <coughs> to decide. What we are concerned is uh, the provisions in the arrangement signed between Hong Kong and the USA concerning the surrender of fugitives. We look, received documents from the US authority. We looked at the uh, documents. As I said, we did not act on the assumption that he has or has not uh, acted in breach of the law. What we are doing at the time is to look at the arrangement, look at the information that was sent to us, and when we decide whether we have sufficient basis to process the request from the US authority. And the long and short of the story is, having looked at the information uh, made available to us, we took the view that there are a few areas which we require further information. As a result of which we in fact very quickly uh, sent in the request to my counterparts here and in the court <coughs> sorry in the course of awaiting answer from my counterparts, uh, Mr. Slowden on his own volition left the uh, uh, territory of Hong Kong. Because Mr. Snowden in so far as the Hong Kong legal system is concerned, has not committed any crime. And therefore, it's not for us uh, to stop him from leaving Hong Kong. And in fact, if we were to stop Mr. Snowden from leaving Hong Kong, we will be acting in breach of the law in uh, Hong Kong. That's the crux of the uh, matter. Good, now can you tell us what was lacking? What kinds of information do the arrangements between the U.S. and Hong Kong require as a showing sufficient to extradite someone? Because this bears not only on the U.S.-China problems now that we really need to focus more on, but it also involves cross-strait problems between Taiwan 
and the mainland. Mm -hmm. We're all facing this problem in what circumstances mm -hmm. does one authority surrender somebody to another authority? What procedures are appropriate? What evidentiary showing is mm -hmm. required? We have no treaty with China, as you well know, and I mm -hmm. said before, but nevertheless, on an ad hoc basis, mm -hmm. without sufficient transparency from an American point of view, our government is beginning to satisfy China's request to send back supposedly corrupt fugitives. Mm -hmm. And your experience is quite relevant, so I need to know more. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm not too sure whether my experience is relevant, because in our case, uh, as you very rightly point out, we have uh, an arrangement signed with the uh, US authority. And on top of that, in Hong Kong, we have a specific piece of legislation dealing with surrender of uh, fugitives. And that ordinance uh, is not only applicable to cases uh, concerning the US, but with all the other jurisdictions with which we have signed uh, similar arrangements. Do you have an agreement with the mainland for no. a rendition of people from Hong Kong to the mainland for a trial? No. Why not? We are still negotiating it. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a long time. Well, uh, yes. 18 years? Yes. Uh, the interesting thing, in fact, uh, if one were to uh, venture into the niceties of uh, legal uh, considerations, in fact, one thing uh, which is uh, uh, fascinating is if you are talking about rendition or extraditions between two sovereign states, you have all the international rules, international practice that you can make references to. But because one country, two system is unique and unprecedented. The question that arises is to what extent those international uh, 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 concepts can be applied in the context of one country, two system. Uh, honestly, uh, they raise this question which are not easy to answer. Although I would, uh, I would be extremely grateful if Professor, you can offer assistance. <laughs> If you ask me, I'll try it. <laughs> I've got in mind. Questions, comments? We have an extraordinary performer here. We should take <laughs> full advantage of it. Yes, please. Yeah, Bob Peters after Sidley Austin. Um, sec Mr. Secretary, I realize that there are certain limitations under the basic law on changes that can be made in the judicial system in Hong Kong. But ultimately, how do you see the mainland and the Hong Kong judicial systems integrating, or coordinating at least? I think, uh, <clears throat> to begin with, uh, each jurisdiction has its own legal history, legal culture, and legal background. So um, each jurisdiction will have its way to find what is best for the particular jurisdictions in question. But having said that, my own personal view is I very much welcome dialogues, communications between different jurisdictions. And that's what I have been doing after I took up my uh, current office. And naturally, that would include exchange <coughs> and dialogues uh, between Hong Kong uh, and the uh, mainland. Uh, maybe I should uh, say, perhaps I should not confine my answer uh, to your questions to the judicial systems of the two jurisdictions, but generally to the two legal systems of the uh, two jurisdictions. We have uh, uh, exchange very often, and uh, we try to understand more of what is going on there, and they also try to understand more of what is going on here. Uh, there are often uh, exchange of views as to uh, issues of common interest. I've also been telling people that uh, nowadays in China, and I'm sure in this regard Professor is more an expert than I am, uh, that when, when China uh, is thinking of uh, enacting a piece of new legislation, uh, very often they embark upon uh, what we common law lawyers uh, describe as comparative law uh, studies. They look at what is the situation in other jurisdictions, from time to time, they will also ask uh, people in Hong Kong, whether informally or otherwise, as to how things can be done 
that happens to say uh, the commercial law, the securities law, that's quite common. So they are quite willing to reach out and see how things are being done in other jurisdictions, both for the purpose of improving the quality of their work and also to ensure that the new legislation would be in a way uh, comfortably accepted by the international community, especially the international commercial uh, uh, community. And another example, more specific examples that I can give is uh, Hong Kong has been uh, <clears throat> very keen to develop uh, dispute resolution services, uh, such as international uh, arbitration. And in this regard, uh, China, is the mainland, is also very keen to develop this part of legal or dispute resolution services. There has been a lot of exchange, and we have been um, telling them how we do things in, in Hong Kong and uh, giving suggestions to them how they can uh, 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 try to consider uh, changing their, their systems. And, and one more uh, recent example, a specific one that I can give is, I'm sure uh, you have read about the uh, so-called Belt and Road Initiative or sometimes described as the One Belt, One Row uh, uh, initiative. In two of the documents issued by the central authorities, including one uh, by the Supreme People's Court, they specifically mention about the role of Hong Kong in contributing to the dispute resolutions uh, which might be used for the Belt and Road <coughs> initiative. And that's the way in which uh, dialogues and, and, and communications between the two jurisdictions can, uh, can be uh, conducted with a will to whether you call enhancing the uh, infrastructure or just to uh, uh, exchange suggestions. That was a very good question and a very good answer and it leads up to the name of the game, the key question. How do you interpret the basic law and the other legal provisions that affect the allocation of power between the central authorities and Hong Kong and the role of the Basic Law Committee. Uh, I was very excited when I saw there would be a Basic Law Committee, what I think six people from Hong Kong and six from the mainland that would advise uh, the National People's Congress. I thought that the document, the basic law, would have more credibility for the people of Hong Kong if they felt there was an impartial arrangement in Beijing for the final interpretation of the meaning of that document. We had a famous Chief Justice who once said, the words of the Constitution, our Constitution, are merely empty vessels into which the courts have to pour concrete meaning. In 1983, when the UK and China signed the joint declaration calling for the basic law, etc., uh, a reporter for the South China Post, C.K. Lau, I think his name was, he later became editor of the paper, he interviewed me and he said, now that these problems are solved, I said, these problems are solved, they're just beginning. <laughs> Every word has got to be interpreted. And the key question is, who is going to interpret them? I had hoped that a convention, a practice, would develop under the basic law where the experts, and there are real experts on the committee, the basic law committee for both sides, would interpret the law after considering the arguments just the way it used to be in London under the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council so that you would then have a recommendation based on objective interpretation that had been fully ventilated, including legal arguments, not just out of a smoke-filled political room, that would go to the NPC, National People's Congress Standing Committee, and would be accepted by them as an authoritative legal interpretation of the basic law. I think that would give the basic law a credibility with the people of Hong Kong and the world that it did not have 
And years ago, when C.H. Tung was the chief executive, and we met in Shanghai, I suggested to him that you could turn this basic law instrument through practice into something really credible instead of just answers coming out of a smoke-filled room that the <laughs> NPC Standing Committee could choose to ignore or not. And he said to me, ah, that would just give Martin Lee and those guys more opportunity to make trouble. <laughs> well, uh, so we're reflecting two different legal traditions here. Could you say something about this process? Because my hope is further, not only to develop a credible constitutional system for Hong Kong, but this would have been a precedent for the rest of China, to have a committee of the National People's Congress, whether the Legal Affairs Committee or some other, really hold hearings, listen to both sides' argument, having a kind of a high court, constitutional court type, type argumentation for the whole country. That's what China has yet to achieve. But I'd love to hear your view on that. <laughs> in, in fact, uh, <clears throat> you touch on a uh, question which I have been uh, thinking for myself over the uh, uh, past few years, if not more. And interestingly, yesterday, uh, as, you, uh, as we were discussing this morning, I uh, had a chance to meet the uh, students at the Columbia Law School uh, and, and uh, Red Hat uh, East Asia Institute. Uh, one point I made yesterday was um, the basic law is very unique in the sense that on the one hand it is a piece of national legislation by uh, China under the Chinese continental or civil law system, however you describe it. On the other hand, it is the constitutional document of Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, when we deal with the basic law, what we do as common law trained lawyers, we apply common law statutory interpretation principle to interpret the basic law. So all the usual uh, canons of interpretation whether you call the golden rule, the mischief rule, the purposive interpretation, those were the techniques that we use day in, day out in courts in Hong Kong, whether for the purpose of construing commercial contract or provisions in the uh, basic law. The intricacy is uh, in the basic law, apart from the courts of Hong Kong who are authorized to interpret the uh, provisions in the basic law, uh, it's also quite clearly stated in the basic law that the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress has the ultimate authority to interpret the basic law. And it has been described by a very leading jurist, uh, Sir Anthony Mason, that that is perhaps the intersection between the common law system in Hong Kong and the continental law systems in uh, China. But the question remains that whether, because of this, whether you call it hybrid nature or unprecedented nature of the uh, basic law, whether ultimately there should be another way or a more systematic way to interpret the uh, 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 basic law. My personal view is, is a very good question that merits serious uh, consideration. In particular, in particular, <coughs> from the point of view uh, of people like me who are trained uh, as a common law lawyers, we are more used to uh, judgments which does not simply spell out the conclusion, but the reasoning behind the conclusion. And the reason being that you ought to tell people how you arrive at a particular conclusion because before you can win the trust and confidence of the people. In fact, uh, w my personal view is if you want to uh, maintain the rule of law, if you want to maintain the independence of the judiciary, you've got to ensure that people have faith and have confidence in the system. Legitimacy. Exactly. And, and one way is to tell people why you arrive at that conclusion. 
people may not agree with your reasoning, but it's still of cardinal importance to tell how you arrive at that uh, conclusion. And therefore, in future, as to how we can further improve <coughs> the systems of interpretation uh, under the basic law in relation to how the provision should be construed, I think how to take this matter forward, as I said earlier, is something that we should, we should uh, 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 study. One interesting thing I, I was uh, uh, all the way saying uh, on, on other occasions is in jurisdictions like Hong Kong where we practice common law, lawyers are used to go to court and we argue cases and we look at past precedents and then we use that as a basis of our argument. But in uh, continental systems there are more research into legal theory, into uh, uh, jurisprudence as to how a basic philosophy should be constructed before resolving practical uh, legal questions. There might be a point here that because we are dealing with the uh, uh, basic law as a piece of national legislation in the context of a common law jurisdiction, perhaps one should consider whether there is somehow a case for marrying the approach of common law lawyers with the uh, skills of continental lawyers so as to take the case further and, and ensure that future interpretation by the MPC Standing Committee uh, would be in the best interest of not just Hong Kong but the entire country and in fact the entire notion of one country, two system, not just for Hong Kong but for Macau and perhaps uh, we can take the matter further from there. Well, you could make no greater contribution to the long-run future of not only Hong Kong but also China if you could get together with Dean Wang Junmin and other experts from the mainland and talk about putting flesh on the bare bones that make this possible. It's been too many years where this practice hasn't developed, and before you know it, Hong Kong's 50-year period will be up. <laughs> Yes, please. Sorry, um, I'm Sue Williams, um, documentary filmmaker. Um, Jerry, you were asking uh, a little bit about the Edward Snowden case, and you asked about what details of information were missing from the American request. And I think in the uh, very animated exchange afterwards, you didn't answer that. And I just wondered what those pieces of information were, because Snowden's sort of escaped by the skin good. of his teeth, and somebody, and somebody somewhere in America must have been kicking themselves. Very good. Thank you for your persistence. <laughs> and, and thank you for uh, reminding me uh, the part that I have forgotten to, uh, to deal with. Uh, I have to, to start off by saying I can only explain uh, by making use of the information which are available in the uh, public uh, domain. Uh, I, I'm glad that I'm not in the positions of David Webb on this occasion. <laughs> uh, two, two aspects. One aspect is the evidence. Because under our regime, we have to satisfy that there are sufficient evidence before we can kickstart the entire uh, process. So one aspect we have been asking is what are the uh, evidence which we take the view that are required under our system and yet not there in the documents sent to us. The other aspect is there are certain uh, details, certain specifics, which we believe need to be clarified. Uh, perhaps if I may make use of this chance also to explain one, one uh, uh, matter which on some occasion I uh, sense some uh, perhaps misunderstanding. Uh, in uh, some of the media report, it has been uh, stated that uh, one of the information we ask is the name of Mr. Snowden. Uh, that is correct, but please do not misunderstand or have the uh, perceptions that uh, we are trying to pay tricks by asking for the names of Mr. Snowden. The reason is this, the whole process, if we were to kickstart the uh, process of surrender of fugitives, is that we will have to have the information available and then prepare our court documents and then my department will have to send the information, the documents, to the courts in Hong Kong, a magistrate in Hong Kong. And the, the court would then issue what we call in Hong Kong a warrant of arrest, which is a document. 
which would entitle the police officers to go and knock on the door of Mr. Snowden and say, are you Mr. Snowden? If you are, then I'm going to arrest you because of this warrant. And uh, you might call it technical, but extradition law or rendition law is extremely technical in many jurisdictions, including uh, Hong Kong. And one very important requirement is the name appearing on the search warrant would have to be exactly the name of the person that you want to arrest. If you got the name wrong, the person can say, sorry, look at my passport, I am not this person. So you do not have a valid warrant to arrest me. Did they or, have the name wrong? Uh, well, the, the, the question is, we have uh, more than one name in more than one document. <laughs> My goodness. That's all I can say. <laughs> and all that we are asking is, can you confirm the name that we, we, we have to use in taking the process further? Otherwise, I don't think I can go to the court in Hong Kong and say, I have three documents, so give me free search warrant. Come what may, I will have one bingo. Remember what Shakespeare said, what's in the name? <laughs> <laughs> Do we have time for one or two more questions? One more. Anybody? Yes, please, in the back. Would you please? Oh, and then make it short so Professor Hasegawa can get a word in, too. Okay. Um, this question will be, uh, I, I come from a small, my name is Ben Moore. Been in New York for a long time, but come from a small town in Ohio, in the Midwest. We have in my uh, small and poor and poorer and poorer town a very curious monument it is a big brick house. We are very proud of this monument. It's one of the few grand things in our town. What we're proud of is that every night in this house, a law was broken. This house, uh, Professor Cohen will understand me that what I'm talking about when I say that this house was a stop on what in America is known as the Underground Railway. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, ask Professor Cohen how he would have uh, dealt with the problem that at the time it was operating would have been presented by that house. And then I'll ask him to ask you, uh, Secretary Yuan, whatever question he feels that leads him to ask you. Yeah, I always start with the Hitler analogy. I, I, I was not going to, uh, whose law is that? Um, there's always a question, law? at what point <clears throat> does it become justifiable in political and moral terms to break the official law. And that's the question one has to confront, whether you're, what is his name, Jonathan Wong in Hong Kong, or Benny Tai, who I know. Joshua Wong. Uh, Joshua. Joshua. Oh, Joshua, Joshua. thank you. Uh, and we have to face that in every specific political, legal, and the quest, uh, environment. And the question in Hong Kong is, and as the Secretary for Justice has said, there are obviously different views on this. And we have yet to see how the Hong Kong courts will deal with Joshua Wong and others whose cases are gradually uh, coming up. But that's another very good and American intelligible example of the problem. Uh, Professor Hasegawa, uh, who teaches Chinese history at NYU and knows all the East Asian languages. Wow. <laughs> Okay, just a brief question, but, but um, I wanted, what I wanted to ask you is the openness of Hong Kong society mm. and where you see uh, Hong Kong is headed. He gives a course on law and society in the history department at NYU. Can I give the answer after I have finished your course? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, recent developments suggest that uh, Hong Kong society as a whole is feeling a lot of pressure, a mm. um, lot of strains on hospitals and financial, uh, societal and other resources, and especially there are many question, questions raised about the citizenship of Hong Kong and who can be um, part of Hong Kong society. And I was, as I was wondering how you see um, the development uh, with regard to the citizenship of Hong Kong and the openness of Hong Kong society going forward. Um, well. I try my best to uh, answer your question. I think this is more than a, a, a legal question. It's not illegal. As, uh, uh, it's not illegal. <laughs> <laughs> At least we we cherish the uh, common law notion that unless it's being said to be illegal, it's legal. <laughs> uh, 
I take the view that uh, Hong Kong society remains a very, very open society. What you have described, in fact, uh, the way I look at it, is it's got nothing to do with the openness of Hong Kong society. What it illustrates, in my view, rather unfortunately, is that in the past year or so, the society of Hong Kong has become more divergent than it has been. People are having very, very different views on one matter, and they are more vocal than before. Therefore, when an issue has arisen, people tend to be more open with their attitude, their thinking. They go out either to express their view uh, by one form, uh, by one means or another, and that's why you would see in the media that there are all these protests, all these demonstrations, all these uh, expressions of will. But uh, what uh, one can say is, if Hong Kong is not an open society, if Hong Kong does not have freedom of the press and freedom of the information, those things would not have happened in the very first place. And those things would not have been reported in the media in the very first place. So uh, that's the reason why I say there's got nothing to do with the openness of Hong Kong society. In fact, I would say Hong Kong is more and more open and definitely we have very good freedom of expressions and freedom of the press and of the media. What is unfortunate and what I think as a government official, uh, what we, the government, has a role to play and has a duty to discharge is to see how we can do something to win the confidence and trust of the Hong Kong people. That is something, although I am from the government, that is something which I do not think I can uh, deny that we need to do. Because unless we have confidence, any single issue, minor, substantial or otherwise, can become a real issue. Uh, rightly or wrongly, that is a matter of politics. That is a matter of real life in, in, in any society nowadays, particularly uh, with uh, the free flow of information. Of course, in practice, without regard to any government intervention, there have been disturbing incidents in Hong Kong of restraints upon the openness of the media, whether one talks about newspapers mm -hmm. or radio or whatever, and this is a constant struggle. Same things happening in Taiwan as mainland influence in both places increases. I know that from my own experience writing for the Hong Kong press. But you have given us a terrific morning, and I want to say how grateful we are. I didn't know what I was going to hear. I'd never met you before. And this was a, a tremendous performance, and I'm grateful to the National Committee it's a wonderful way to celebrate their new quarters here, uh, which are really terrific. The music uh, we've fans got to the close now. Know about the name. Pardon? <laughs> the, the classical music fans in the audience want to know about your name. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's not uh, my parents who gave me this name. Uh, in Hong Kong in the 1970s, uh, it's quite common for people to have Christian names like Peter, David, or so. My uh, parents, uh, in fact, is, uh, they, they are not very well educated. They can't even speak English. So uh, I never, until uh, Form 3, I don't have any Christian, I didn't have any Christian name. But because it was fashionable in, at that time, one day my music teacher <laughs> called me and some of my other classmates who did not have uh, a Christian name into her room and said that, how come you didn't have a Christian name? I said, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> My parents didn't give me one, and they, they don't, didn't speak English. So, and then he was pointing to all my other uh, classmates and said, you call this, you call this, you call this. And when it was my turn, he said, okay, you call Rimsky. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was always saying to my uh, friends that I was so uh, fortunate because it was, as you know, it's the first part of the double barrel name of Rimsky Kosakov. Yeah. If my music teacher were to say, you call Kosakov, <laughs> then I would have difficulty in spelling the name in the very first place. <laughs> so I find myself fortunate in that sense. <laughs> I, I'm glad 
to hear that story, I often marvel at some of the Christian names Chinese parents give their children, and I often wonder how different my own career might have been if my parents had had the wit to call me Socrates. <laughs> Can I uh, say from the bottom of my heart, I'm so honored to have this opportunity and I'm truly grateful for uh, you taking time out of your schedule to uh, meet me and uh, it's a very enjoyable morning and I hope that uh, uh, in future we can continue the uh, dialogue and the communication. Thank you very much. Come back soon.